The first thing we need to know is that Dragon Ball Hakai was created while the manga was in Moro's arch. So this story happens after this arch. Well, the story begins with a narrator telling that Moro was a great evil for Universe 7, but he was defeated and then the universe was in peace until now. We go to a mysterious place, a kind of platform present in the sky of a planet, but something wrong is happening here. A battle is happening and we see a guy being thrown from the sky onto this platform. We find out that who took this blow was a guy named Anzen and from what we saw later on, he seems to be the leader of the Celestial Guardians. Another guy goes to Anzen and that guardian reminds me a lot of Yajoribe. From what they are saying, it seems that a guy attacked the guardians in a well-planned way and caught them off guard and according to this guardian, this guy was making everyone freak out and kill themselves. From what the situation showed us, the guardians were trying to take a little box somewhere and somehow that was very important to the universes but this mysterious guy wanted to stop them for some reason. The guardians didn't have much time to talk because the enemy was coming and then the fat guardian told Anzen to move on and he would delay this guy. As expected, the guardian doesn't make it and dies. And then, when Anzen is about to lock himself in a room that, according to him, the enemy couldn't enter, the guy ends up entering when the door was almost closing. Poor Anzen, he almost did it. Although the enemy is much stronger than him, Anzen seems to be very motivated to put the box he was carrying in a bigger box, and he called this little box the battery box, and the bigger box the ceiling box, and their function we will understand a little better later. After facing this opponent a little bit, Anzen managed to push him away and get the battery box, but when he was going to put it in the ceiling box, he ended up being hit from behind by the enemy. Guys, the scene was too brutal. The guy simply ripped Anzen's body from behind, took the box from his hands, and then removed, destroying even more his chest and back. It was really gory. Continuing, when Anzen is defeated by this mysterious enemy, he ends up destroying that small battery box. And then, the ceiling box, the big one, releases a kind of light, and four mysterious beings come out of it, which, as the scene has already suggested to us, they were sealed inside. But who are these four? Who is this mysterious enemy that killed the Guardians? Only time will tell us. Continuing with the analysis, the manga cuts to Universe 7's planet of destruction, the Beerus planet. There, Goku and Vegeta are with Wiz, and Beerus is taking a nap as usual. The two Saiyans are in their Super Saiyan blue forms, Goku using the Kaioken, sure, increased 20-fold, and Vegeta using the evolved stage of the blue form. During their fight, we see that Vegeta has a little advantage, and Goku needs to back off. Goku realizes that Vegeta has already discovered his weakness, and then Vegeta reveals that although the evolved blue form and the Super Saiyan blue with Kaioken have the same strength, Goku still has the disadvantage because the use of Kaioken is very exhausting for him, and because of this, he has less durability in the fight. In short, they both start with the same power level, but Goku gets tired much faster by using the Kaioken, and then he gets weaker, while Vegeta manages to maintain his level longer. Well, Goku gets a little more beat up by Vegeta, who tells him to use Ultra Instinct, that's very funny because Goku says he didn't want to use Ultra Instinct because otherwise he would beat Vegeta very easily and it wouldn't be fun. It was hilarious to see Vegeta's angry reaction. To protect his pride, Vegeta insists, ordering Goku to use his true power. So Goku finally uses Ultra Instinct and after that, he asks if Vegeta will use the Hakai in the fight, saying that he was training this technique with Beerus. With that affirmation, it's clear to us that, chronologically, this manga is taking place in that time skip between Moro's defeat and the appearance of Granola in the Dragon Ball Super manga. Well, continuing with the analysis, as expected, Goku quickly ended up with Vegeta in his evolved blue form. But the noise of the Saiyan's combat woke up Beerus, who was very angry and came out to beat Goku and Vegeta. But he ignored Vegeta when he saw him all smashed there on the ground. And at that moment, he and Goku faced each other. And when they were ready to fight, Whis interfered, stopping their blows with his finger. To explain in the meantime, while Goku and Vegeta were fighting, Whis received a communication from the Grand Priest. And the Grand Priest announced that there would be a meeting between the gods and the angels. And the reason for this meeting is a shutdown announcement and Goku and Vegeta have to go too. This Daishinkan's revelation make Whis quite impressed, and when Whis stopped Goku and Beerus, he talked about his meeting, which completely scared Beerus. 
Goku, curious, wanted to know what this shutdown announcement was about, and Whis explained that this was a very rare type of meeting where one god of destruction is removed from his position and another is announced, and if Goku and Vegeta were being called, it was because one of them would be the next god of destruction. Like all of us, Goku was completely shocked. Zeno's Palace all the angels, gods of destruction, and gods of creation are gathered in the great hall of the almighty Zeno's palace. They were all called there for an important meeting, and they were waiting for the most important participants of that meeting. They arrive, Goku and Vegeta, accompanied by Beerus, Wiz, and Shin. As soon as they arrive, everyone kneels, with the exception of Goku, who greets the supreme deities with total irreverence and is reciprocated by them in the same way. But Goku notes that, unlike the Xenos, the others in that place aren't as happy by his presence, and the Saiyan comments that everyone seems to hate him. Vegeta confirms this suspicion and tells him not to make things worse. Beerus scolds the two, ordering them to shut up before they were reprimanded, and he also orders Goku to kneel, and so the Saiyan does. Daishinkan reveals that it's time to start the subject, and that only the candidates and their master should remain in the center, that is Goku, Vegeta, and Wiz. The Grand Prix sends Beerus and Shin to the side of the others. After doing this, Daishinkan starts saying that everyone already knows the reason for that meeting. That was a shutdown announcement, and at that moment, a god of destruction would be removed from his position, and who would take his place would be one of the mortals, Son Goku or Vegeta IV. Goku, again without any reverence, gets up and asks why he and Vegeta were chosen, arguing that there are other persons more capable than them, such as Topo and Jiren. But Daishinkan explains that right now, Goku and Vegeta are the only mortals in the 12 universes who are receiving angel training, and this is a very important requirement to become a god of destruction. He also explains that Jiren, even though he's very powerful, is not being trained by his angel and his god of destruction, and Topo will take Belmont's place in the future, and that's why he wasn't chosen. Goku is very dismayed to hear that. Vegeta, on the other hand, is resigned, saying that he's already accepted the possibility as a condition for training with Wiz, and the Grand Priest is glad to hear that from him. Daishinkan then proceeds with the proceedings by asking Wiz, the master of the two candidates, to state his qualities and competences to assume the position as God of Destruction. Wiz begins to say that Goku is a very powerful warrior and was able to master Ultra Instinct, something that not even the gods of his generation could do. But on the other hand, he doesn't see any other qualities in Goku. The angel claims that his disciple is very absent-minded and is so kind that it comes close to stupidity. In short, with the exception of the fact that Goku is powerful, Wiz doesn't see any other qualities in him to be a god of destruction. Goku doesn't like this very much, but what can he do? It's true. Now talking about Vegeta, Wiz says he doesn't know Ultra Instinct, but he is learning Hakai and seems promising in learning the technique. The angel also says that, unlike Goku, Vegeta acts with intelligence and seriousness, and he possesses the ferocity necessary to be a god of destruction. Obviously, Vegeta is very proud and brags to Goku that he is better than him. After hearing this report from Wiz, the master of the two candidates, Daishinkan, proceeds by saying that now all the gods and angels must assess everything that has been said and vote on who they think should be the next god of destruction. And after the vote, the great Zeno will give his final decision. The gods and angels gathered to vote, and after a while, Daishinkan already had the result. He announced that all the gods of destruction and angels voted unanimously, and with a score of 24 to 0, the one chosen by the deities was Vegeta. Of course, the prince of the Saiyans teased Goku with this, and although he didn't want to become a god of destruction, he was annoyed by such disproportionate result. Daishinkan, speaking to the Xenos, says that according to the decision, decision of all the gods of destruction and angels, the one who should be chosen as the next god of destruction should be Vegeta. But the Xenos don't care what others say and choose Goku, leaving everyone at that meeting absolutely shocked. Very angry by this one-sided choice of the Xenos, Vegeta is about to protest, but Beerus, fearing an action from the Supreme Deity, scolds the Saiyan. Faced with the threat of the Destroyer, Vegeta gives up talking and kneels down again. Understanding that he would be a god of destruction, Goku is very upset. But with no choice, he just asks which universe he will go to. That question brings the Grand Priest into the second part of that meeting, announcing which god of destruction will be deposed. He says that among the 12 destroyers, only four of them are doing a satisfactory job, which are those four whose universes didn't participate in the Tournament of Power. Jin from the 12th universe, Liquor of the 8th universe, Arak from the 5th universe, and Iwan from the 1st universe. With the exception of these four, all the gods are at risk of being deposed. That's because the average of their universes have fallen too far, and some have even disobeyed the divine rules acting in their own benefit. Hearing these serious statements from the Grand Priest, the gods are frightened. 
Daishin Kan finally reveals which destroyer will be removed, and the destroyer is Champa of the Universe 6. With the Grand Priest's revelation, Champa is apparently saddened, and not only him, but other deities as well, including Beerus. Daishin Kan asks Champa to go to the center and to Fuwa, the Supreme Kai, to join him. When they do this, Daishin Kan says that in addition to Champa's universe having a very low average, showing the neglect of him as a god, he also broke the realm rules by entering Universe 7 without the god's permission to collect the wish orbs. For these reasons, he is being removed from his post. Champa, apparently resigned, says he's been waiting for this, but asks what happens to him now. The father of angels replies that he will now lose his energy of destruction, and losing his divinity, he will begin to age again from the moment he became a god. And because he was the ruler of Universe 6, he could choose any planet in that universe to live his life as a mortal. Champa decides to choose Universe 6's planet Earth as his home probably because of the delicious foods on the planet and perhaps because it's a gift from his brother. Fuwa sadly says that he tried to convince Champa to work properly many times, but was always scolded by him. He ends by saying that it is sad to end up like this. Daishin Kan tells Fuwa that because his life to be bound by Champa's energy of destruction, with the loss of the destroyer's divinity, he will inevitably die. Now your destiny is to return to the supreme planet of Universe 6 as a dead god. Like Champa, Fuwa accepts his fate Daishin Kan asks the Xenos to do the procedure, and so they do. With the removal of Champa's deity, a halo appears on Fuwa's head. Champa was no longer a god, and Fuwa was a dead god. This is the fate of the gods of Universe 6. Daishin Kan asks Vados to accompany Champa and Fuwa back to Universe 6. She immediately complies, but not without acting out of false sadness at her former student's fate. And obviously, Champa unmasks his bad acting. When Vados is taking him and Fuwa away, Champa takes one last look at his brother, Beerus. After that, give a last look to his brother too, a discreet display of affection. After that, the Daishin Kan concludes the meeting by saying the preparations for the formation of a new god of destruction takes approximately 24 Earth hours. Until then, all gods are dismissed. He instructs Goku to be on Universe 6's planet of destruction within 24 hours. Until then, he can do whatever he wants. After these closing words of the Grand Priest, all the other gods and angels go away. Only those from Universe 7 are left in the palace. The Xenos waste no time in going to Goku to ask him to play with them, but Goku kindly denies it, saying that he needs to go back to Earth and say goodbye to everyone, and even ventures to say that Bulma will prepare a party for him. Nothing pretentious about this Goku. The Xenos don't care. After all, now that Goku is a god, he'll be able to play with them for a long time, even whole centuries, right? Goku is a little scared with this affirmation and immediately makes an excuse to get out of there. Then they leave. Capsule Corporation. When they arrive at Capsule Corporation, Chi Chi and Bulma are there, relaxing in the garden, and also Goten and Trunks are there having some fun. Goku is startled to see his wife there. When the two women reach them, Bulma is alarmed that they're back so soon this time, and seeing Beerus, Whis, and Shin asks if Earth is in danger again. Beerus answers this question, saying he's there because Goku mentioned a farewell party. Hearing this, Chi Chi asks who is leaving, and Goku decides to tell her the truth, revealing that he will be a god of destruction from another universe. After everyone's shock, Chi Chi faints. As soon as she received the news from Goku, Bulma called an emergency party, calling all of their friends and everyone wanted to better understand what was happening and also to say goodbye to Goku. It was only at night that Chi Chi finally woke up. Goku immediately justifies himself, saying that he didn't want to be a god, but it was the Xenos who chose him. Bulma asks why he didn't deny it, and he replies that if he had, he could have been killed, or worse, the entire Universe 7 would be destroyed. But to everyone's surprise, Chi Chi is starting to accept the idea, saying that at least Goku would have a job, and this time, a job that suits him better than being a farmer. Gohan disagrees with his mother, arguing that the work of a god of destruction is too cruel, and he doesn't see Goku doing such things. Beerus agrees with Goku's son, but says he couldn't argue with the decision from the great Zeno. Trunks questions his father if he lost to Goku again, but shuts up when he is threatened with a beating. Bulma asks Goku how he's going to destroy planets if he can't even kill his own enemies. The Saiyan replies that Daishin Kan told him that a god of destruction's job was much more than just destroying things, and that he would see that. But he also says that he'll avoid killing people as much as possible. Gohan asks if Goku will work with the Supreme Kai, and he says he doesn't know, because Universe 6's Supreme Kai died when Champa lost his divinity. But Shin reassures him by explaining that Fuwa died because he had his life linked to the Champa's energy of destruction, but when the ritual to make Goku a deity was done, he would also have his life linked to a Supreme Kai. Goku, curious, asks how a Supreme Kai is chosen. Shin says that there are a few ways this could happen, 
But in this case, the Universe 6's Kaiju Tree probably bore golden fruit, which is probably why they've decided to change the God of Destruction just now. Continuing with the interrogation, Vegeta asks what the Kaiju Tree is, and Shin explains that he and all Supreme Kais, as well as the King Kais, belong to a race called Shinjin. Shinjins are all born from a divine tree called Kaiju Tree. The common fruits of this tree give life to Kingo Kais, while Golden Fruits, which are much rarer, give life to Supreme Kais. Probably a golden fruit was born on Universe 6's Kaiju Tree, which is why they're making this exchange now. Trunks is surprised that Shinjins are born from a tree, and he thinks that's weird. But Wiz argues that it's much better than the way they're born. Such a comment provokes curiosity in Goten. After all, how are we born? Chi Chi is furious with Wiz. She probably hasn't had that conversation with her son yet. The angel apologizes for his inappropriate comment. Goku, still in the conversation about the birth of Shinjins, asks about what happens if a fruit is born rotten. Shin explains that when an ordinary fruit is born rotten, Makayos, corrupted King Kais, are born. And when a golden fruit is born rotten, a Makayoshin, a corrupted Supreme Kai, is born. In all cases, these corrupted gods are sent to the demon realm, and they rule there. Shin further explains that they met a Makayoshin a few years ago. That was Dabura. That is, he and Dabura belong to the same race. They obviously are in shock with this information. Beerus, strangely uncomfortable with this matter, interrupts the conversation, saying it was time for them to go. Ready to say goodbye to her husband, Chi Chi asks if Goku will be able to visit them. Wiz replies explaining that until Goku learns the basics of his role, his universe, and how to control his powers, he won't be able to visit them. But as her sister, Vados, is quite strict in her training, maybe that won't take long to happen, so he can visit them. That's if Beerus doesn't mind, of course. But for the Destroyer, whatever. Goten asks his father if he could go along with him to train. It's Wiz who answers that question too, saying no. Mortals cannot stay long in other universes, except in exceptional cases. But Goku comforts his son by saying that when he does return, he wants Goten to be strong enough for them to train together. Goten, excited, promises his father that he'll get stronger. So Goku ends his family's farewell by asking Gohan to take care of them. The firstborn assures Goku that he will. The next to say goodbye are the members of Goku's martial arts school. Krillin says goodbye, asking Goku never to forget his essence as an earthling. And Master Roshi tells his disciple to show the gods the power of the turtle school. Finally, Vegeta tells Goku that it doesn't matter whether or not he's a god, he'll be the strongest. Goku doubts that. Then the big moment arrives, and Goku leaves with the gods to the other universe, starting his new journey as a god of destruction. Bulma, who was his companion in his first journey, wishes him good luck and says they'll be waiting for him. Everything seems normal on Universe 6's planet of destruction, but there's nothing normal about the day. Someone arrives at high speed on the planet. It's Goku, accompanied by Wiz, Beerus, and the Supreme Kai. The Saiyan comments that place is identical to Beerus's planet, and the god of destruction comments that the god's planet planets are the same. But there isn't much time for them to talk. Vados immediately arrives to greet them. Beerus, wasting no time, asks about the food and has Goku's full approval on this question. But Vados is sorry to say that there's no time for food. It's almost time for the ritual to start, which scares Goku. Inside the castle, walking down a dark corridor, Goku doesn't have a happy expression. Wiz wants to know the reason for such sadness, and Goku reveals the obvious. That place was so depressing, he didn't want to live there. But Vados tries to cheer him up by saying that there are many places to see in the universe, but he will also be busy since Champa left a lot of work accumulated. Also, as a god, he would have many special trainings. The part where it says training really cheers up Goku, which changes his mood. They finally arrive at the place where the ritual would take place, and there are already gathered all the others who will participate. The 12 gods of destruction, the 12 angels, the 12 gods of creation, and of course, the grand priest. Goku is scared that everyone is looking at him so much. Was he late? Vado says, no, they were two minutes early. But these meetings were always very tense. Goku looks for the Xenos, and Beerus says they won't come, because they don't like this kind of meeting. The Destroyer agrees with them, but unlike the Supreme Gods, he can't deny his participation. Something catches Goku's attention. He notices three statues in one corner of the room. One of these statues belongs to Champa, and the other two are unknown people. But looking at the costumes, we see that they're all gods of destruction. One of them is a strange lizard man, and the other looks a lot like Tapion, a character from the latest Dragon Ball Z movie. Goku asks who they are, and Bato says they're all all the ancient gods of destruction from Universe 6, and as he can see, Champa is the third. Goku is surprised that the gods was changed so many times. Wiz explains that eventually, the destroyers leave their position. This can happen at their own request, by expulsion, or even by death. 
The last phrase scares Goku, who can't think of anyone killing beings as powerful as the gods of destruction. Beerus explains that in this thing they call existence, there are many powerful beings, and that even though the gods of destruction are very high on that scale, they are still very far from the top. Bottles promises Goku that he will teach him about it in his lessons. But what he needs to know now is that there are three generations of gods of destruction, and he's the first deity of the fourth generation. Goku seems to understand. He says the Topo is being groomed to be Universe 11's new god of destruction, just as he and Vegeta were being groomed to be Universe 7's new gods. Beerus praises Goku's sudden insight, but states that the change of generations can be very slow, and the time of reign from one god to the next can take up to millions of years. Daishinkan announces that the time has finally come to begin the ritual. He has two pillows in front of him, one of them empty, the other with a golden fruit on top. Daishinkan asks Goku to sit on the reserved pillow, and facing that strange fruit, Goku asks what it is. The Grand Priest explains that that fruit will be the new Supreme Kai of the universe, and that once their lives were connected, the Supreme Kai would be born. Goku thinks that he was a little weird, but okay. Daishinkan asks Goku to completely empty his mind, and that it's important to do that. The Saiyan obeys, and then a kind of energy starts to circulate around, and two small energy balls appear, one white, the other purple. Purple energy goes to Goku. After that, he opens his eyes, and he's already dressed as a god of destruction. When he looks to his side, he sees a Supreme Kai standing there. He says he didn't see her, and she says why. His eyes was closed. Goku takes a good look at Supreme Kai and reveals not knowing that these beings can be born female. She explains that Supreme Kais are genderless, but that they can be born with a female appearance. After explaining this, she introduces herself. Her name is Liai. Goku responds by saying his name as well. Daishin Ken says that they better get along very well, for from now on, their lives are connected, and they must work in harmony for the good of the universe. Goku changes the subject by asking Daishinkan if the ritual went well. That's because he didn't feel any different. But the angel says that, yes, everything was fine, but that he will only feel the changes in his body gradually. But he has stopped aging, meaning he is now a deity. Vados, playful as ever, says that Goku looked better in that costume than Champa, and only now does the Saiyan God realize he was no longer wearing his usual clothes. All the deities present in that place approach. Daishin Ken commands all angels to greet the new god of destruction and the goddess of creation, Son Goku and Liai. After that, he tells the new gods that it is now their duty to work for the peace and good of Universe 6. They agree. After that, Daishin Ken ends the meeting. Everyone leaves with the exception of the gods of Universe 7 and Universe 6. Coming to Goku, Wiz, his previous master, asks if he still doesn't feel differences in his body. Goku this time says yes. He feels like there's a strange energy inside of him. Wiz understands and says it's the energy of destruction. Goku doesn't understand very well and asks if the angel refers to Hakai. The answer comes from Vados, who explains that Hakai and the energy of destruction are not the same thing. Both are similar, since Akai is a byproduct of the energy of destruction, but there are differences between these two concepts. But she says he'll learn that later. Goku doesn't understand anything she said, but gets excited anyway. He looks at Beerus and says he's going to train hard so they can have their rematch. Beerus smiles, saying he's barely become a god and is already getting arrogant. He then calls Wiz and Shin to go home, and they go, leaving the gods from this universe alone. Liai is confused. She doesn't know what to do, which is understandable. After all, she was born a few minutes ago. Well, Models explains that, as has been said, Champa and Fuwa didn't do a good job. More Champa's fault, to be fair. Anyway, the new gods now need to prepare to do a good job. Goku will train with her. Meanwhile, Liai must go to her assistant, a god named Kiboru, who has been waiting for her. Kiboru was waiting for the ritual to end to take her so Liai must go with him. The new Supreme Kai walks up to her assistant and greets him. The assistant does the same. After that, they leave. Now, only Goku and Bottles are there. Goku asks if he can wear his usual clothes. He doesn't really like that God of Destruction costume. Bottles replies yes. While on his planet, he can wear whatever suit he wants. The God of Destruction outfit is only mandatory on formal occasions. After changing Goku's clothes, Bottles asks if they can start with activities now. Goku says he's tired. He hasn't been able to rest since he started this whole thing about becoming a God of Destruction. Destruction. Bottles agrees and asks if she should wake him up in approximately 35 years. Goku freaks out. Would he need to sleep for decades now? Couldn't he just wake up tomorrow? Bottles laughs. She now remembers that sleeping for so long is a characteristic of the Neko Sajans, 
probably the name of Beerus and Champa's race. Now that she would deal with an waking god every day, things would change a lot. Meanwhile, in Universe 7, Beerus is sitting on a tree stump watching his planet's lake. Wiz watches him. He asks if the destroyer is okay and that he's been there since he got home from the meeting, which is many hours ago. Beerus says he's enjoying the silence and quiet, but Wiz refutes it, saying he doesn't seem to be enjoying it that much. Beerus admits something is bothering him. It's a little too quiet. He must have gotten used to those idiots over there. Wiz agrees that two are really fun, especially Goku, with his goofy, laid-back personality. Speaking of Goku, Beerus asks how Wiz thinks he's gonna deal with this whole God of Destruction thing. He always said he couldn't destroy anything. Wiz says that's a good question. How would Goku handle all the moral dilemmas this role entails? But the angel says he will no longer be the same and asks if that's what worries Beerus. The destroyer smiles. Worried? He? No. He is at most curious. He says he's going to take advantage of the silence to get some sleep and that, in a month, Wiz could wake him up to go to Bulma's for something to eat. The angel obviously agrees. Beerus flies out of there, but as he flies, he wonders why he is so concerned about the life of a mere human. Did he care more than he should? The next day, after a long rest, Goku begins his training as a god of destruction. Bottles and Goku are on the planet's field. The Destroyer's master explains that the first step of his training will be to access his Destroyer's energy. Goku asks how he does it. Fado says that there are several stages of controlling this energy and that he will learn this over time. For now, he'll do it in the simplest way, which is to feel the feelings necessary for destruction. Goku doesn't understand this information very well. Does he access the energy of destruction with feelings? Fados explains that when someone is destroying something, it is natural to feel things like anger and other negative feelings. Goku smiles. It would be easy for him. He already feels angry when he transforms into a Super Saiyan. But Vados explains that it's not so simple. His rage cannot be simple. It has to be a specific rage, a desire for pure destruction. He needs to rid his mind of any hesitation. He just needs to want to destroy and nothing else. Goku comments that Vegeta said something similar to him when he told him about his training with Beerus. Vados says the form of training may be the same, but the result won't be. All a mortal can do is simulate the energy of destruction in order to perform Hakai. But this is a limited simulation and it can't compare to the destructive power of a true Hakaishin. Well, even after all this explanation, Goku doesn't understand anything. Bottles gives up the verbal explanation and suggests a practical approach. Goku prefers it that way and says he's going to be very angry. He increases his ki, even causing weather anomalies on the planet, but it's all useless. Bottles tells him to stop. He's not using the energy of destruction, just ordinary ki. Goku is disappointed. He felt all the anger he could feel and it still didn't work. Bottle says that if it wasn't working that way, they had to try another way. Meditation. She says that by doing this, Goku will be able to find the energy of destruction in his body. And if he can do that, he should familiarize himself with it. Goku still doesn't quite understand, but says he'll try while sitting in a meditation pose. Bottle says to the Saiyan God to focus and try to feel all of his ki, as well as his thoughts and feelings. He will find a source of negative energy within himself himself probably in the darkest places of his mind. When he finds this source of energy, he must merge with that energy. But he must be careful, because if his will is weak, the energy will consume him. Goku manages to reach the dark region of his mind, but he thinks that place is too scary, and he had no idea that such a place could exist inside him. Goku closes his eyes and concentrates to find the negative energy, and when he does, he flies towards it. The energy source is a large globe of purple energy, and seeing that, Goku says he gets chills just getting close. Goku touches the energy and then he starts to feel something bad and according to him he never felt so much pain in his life and he's also feeling a great rage. Goku suddenly remembers his moments with his grandfather and his death, remembers the times Krillin died at the hands of Tambourine and Frieza and also remembers Miris' death. But the Saiyan says with great determination that that energy will not consume him, it will obey him and give him power. An impact wave makes the planet windy. Bottles wonders if he was successful in his internal journey, but when Goku stands up with a serious expression and forms a small ball of destructive energy in his hand, she wonders if he's been overpowered. Goku exhales an aura of ki, but then disperses that ki along with the energy in his hand. Goku signals to her, it's okay. Vados congratulates the destroyer and says that the first step of his training is complete. Planet Hale is an inhospitable planet with an icy climate where apparently no living being is able to survive for long. On top of a large glacier, a ship lands, which we can identify as Frieza's ship. The ship's gate opens, and who comes out is Frieza, accompanied by his two loyal servants, Kikono and Barry Blue. 
They walk across the glacier until they come to a rock of ice. Kikono presses a button that is hidden in his rock and it's revealed that it's actually an elevator. They enter the elevator, which takes them inside the glacier. While in the elevator, Frieza comments that it's been a long time since they've been in that place. Barry Blue agrees and adds, that's the last time King Cold was with them. They went there to lock someone up. Actually, that prison was built to hold that person, and after that, it was no longer necessary for them to go there. When the elevator door opens, they're in a hall inside the glacier, and in that hall are several soldiers from Frieza's army. At first, they're talking casually. However, when they see the Emperor, they are immediately startled and kneel down. Frieza smiles says that there are many soldiers there, but they're all useless. If he woke up, they would all be killed. Barry Blue, in his thoughts, remembers that many years ago, the general of Cold's army was the Great Cooler, Cold's firstborn son and Frieza's older brother. Cooler, as general of Cold's army, won many victories for his father's empire. However, his power was so great that even the king feared him, as Cooler was much more powerful than Cold and Frieza. So, fearing that his eldest son would usurp his throne, Cold, along with Frieza, betrayed Cooler and imprisoned him and his most trusted soldiers in the prison built especially for him. This prison, they're in. They arrive in front of a large door and Frieza, pressing a button, opens it. This is the door of a big hall, where in the center, there's a big capsule. Inside that capsule, there's someone in prison. That person is Cooler, and his arms and legs are stuck in metal blocks, and around him, there's a strange liquid. Upon seeing his brother, Frieza praises Kikono, saying that the prison capsule he created is still effective even after many years have passed. Kikono thanks his lord's praise and explains that the liquid inside the capsule contains a powerful sedative, which keeps Cooler paralyzed and sleepy, and those blocks that hold Cooler's arms and legs emit a very specific type of radiation that neutralizes Ki. Kikono adds that he worked for months to build that capsule and also spent a lot of resources. Frieza again praises Kikono's work but orders him to empty the capsule. Kikono is surprised by that order and asks if Frieza is sure about that. He says that only the metal blocks might not be enough to keep Cooler under control. Frieza explains that his brother was much more powerful than him and his father in the past. However, since being arrested, Cooler has not increased his powers but he, Frieza, has gotten much more powerful his brother was no longer a problem. Kikuna obeys, and when he presses a few buttons on the computer, the capsule begins to pour the sedative liquid, and Cooler reacts immediately. Kikuno is surprised. In a few seconds, he was already starting to react, but Barry Blue wasn't surprised. Could anything less be expected of the great Cooler? Cooler wakes up, and then, with great rage, shouts his brother's name, who responds with a sarcastic smile and compliment. Cooler asks how that bastard dared to stand in front of him, and what about Cold? Did he not deserve his father's illustrious presence? But Frieza gives him the news. Cold has been dead for a while. Cooler doesn't like to hear that news. He was the one who should have killed Cold, but the shock was yet to come. Frieza says that, oddly enough, it was a Saiyan who eliminated the king. Cooler says that was impossible. Those monkeys could not kill their father. Frieza explains that a lot has changed since he was imprisoned. In fact, the Saiyans were no longer the weak beings they used to subjugate. And as painful as it may be, there are Saiyans stronger than them. But to Cooler, it was blasphemy. How could Frieza let this happen? Cooler's power increased increasingly awakening began to crack the metal blocks that held him, which scares Kikuno and Barry Blue. But Frieza, with a sad expression, says that unfortunately their army, which once dominated everything they wanted, is now no longer sovereign in the universe. And Frieza says he needs his brother to join him so that together they form a powerful elite of warriors that is capable to defeat the Saiyans who live on Earth. But Cooler thinks that proposal is absurd. Join him? No, he would kill him, and he would kill his servants. And then he himself would go to Earth and kill those Saiyans. Kikuno yells for Frieza to be careful, and then Kulo breaks free of his handcuffs, and the pressure of the prisoner's energy launches Kikuno and Barry Blue out of that room, and also pushes back the soldiers that were in the hallway. Afterwards, Cooler flies to Frieza to land a hit on his younger brother, but is completely shocked when Frieza easily handles his hit with one hand. Frieza says he's very happy that his brother's powers have not decreased by even 1% in all those years. But time has passed, and now Cooler's power is totally surpassed. Frieza starts releasing his energy, knocking Cooler to the ground, completely scared, and then he shows the golden form with a smile, proud of his power. Cooler opens his eyes wide to see that transformation. He is shocked. That form 
surpassed all his transformations. Frieza agrees, but tells his brother not to be sad. If Cooler joined him, he would teach him that transformation. And he adds that together they will form a powerful elite that will overcome the warriors of planet Earth and also all gods of the universe. In this way, Frieza's army would once again be sovereign in the universe. Cooler, seeing no other option, finally agrees, with the only condition that Frieza also free his special forces, who were also trapped in that prison. Frieza agrees, and the two brothers seal the deal with a handshake. A few minutes later, they finally leave the prison. Frieza, Kikuno, and Barry Blue are now joined by Cooler and Cooler's special forces, the elite troop of the former general of Cold's army. Entering the ship, Cooler notes that it was much more technological than the ships they used in the past, and Frieza says that he must thank Kikuno, who built that wonder. Cooler looks at Kikuno, who fears him very much. Frieza says that the ship was not only beautiful and comfortable, but that it also had very spacious and sturdy special training rooms, and it was also much faster than the old ships, which was perfect for the trips they would take. Cooler observes a creature of the Yadarat race in one place of the ship. He asks who it is, and Frieza says his name is Linzur. Cooler asks why he's there and says he seems to be very weak, but Frieza explains that his abilities will be very useful and he'll see that in the future. Cooler changes the subject and asks what they will do from now on. Frieza goes to a computer and presses a button, then an image of five cocoons appears, and below each cocoon is their names. They are Janemba, Hiru, Hatch, Majin Buu, and Kalimor. Frieza explains that in addition to Cooler, he has selected five other extremely powerful warriors, or rather five super powerful beasts. He states, with these creatures, they will be able to subdue all warriors on Earth and also all gods of all universes. But Cooler doesn't understand that very well. Gods? Universes? Frieza said strange things. But Frieza assures his brother that he will explain everything in due time. All he needs to know now is that there are beings far more powerful than they are and they've their lives in their hands. But with these beasts, they will be able to defeat these beings. Cooler says that this conversation about gods and universes can wait. He wants to know more about these such powerful beasts. Taking a closer look at Majin Buu's image, Cooler recognizes him. He comments that he's seen that creature somewhere. It's that Majin Buu that millions of years ago destroyed hundreds of civilizations. Many years ago, Cold's army investigated this creature because of the mythology about him that they found in some parts of the universe. Cold, at that time, instructed them not to bother Majin Buu in case they encountered him. The existence of that creature was a taboo. Frieza explains that these beasts are called the five great primal beasts. They are super powerful creatures that are part of a deity sealed away many years ago. He doesn't know the details, but he knows that these creatures can surpass even the gods of destruction. About Majin Buu, from what he found out, a part of his power was released many years ago by a mage named BBD, and it was that part of Majin Buu's power that caused all that destruction they'd heard about. That part of Majin Buu was released again a few years ago, but was defeated by the Saiyans. However, there's still most of Majin Buu's power that has not been unleashed, and is this part that Frieza intends to use. Cooler is surprised. How can his brother know so much? How does he know about those beings and where to find them? Frieza explains that he learned all of this from a being called Zuno, an omniscient being who lives in their universe. He forced Zuno to reveal all this information. Zuno talked a little too much, wanted to tell everything in detail, so he forced him to summarize the information. And the important thing is that now he knows who the beasts are and where to find them. Frieza points to one of the creatures, Janemba, and says he will be the first they meet. Eager, Cooler tells him to go soon. He's curious to find these primal beasts. A month later, Kikuno and Barry Blue are bored by the trip, but suddenly something alerts them, a massive fissure in space. Kikuno thinks it must be there, but Barry Blue is sure it is. Frieza and Cooler are training in a special room. Cooler is completely exhausted while Frieza is apparently fine. Frieza praises his older brother, saying that in that month of training, he evolved what he would have evolved in two or three months. But Cooler is not surprised. After all, he's the great Cooler. But in his thoughts, Frieza says he'll be watching his brother's evolution, and if for some reason he thinks Cooler might be a threat, he won't hesitate to kill him. Their conversation and Frieza's thoughts are interrupted by Barry Blue, who warns them that they're arriving. Frieza and Cooler go to the main room of the ship, where they see where they're going. Cooler asks what is that place, and why are they going there? Frieza explains it's a fissure in space that will lead them to the Makai world, or Realm of Demons, where they will find the new recruit. Kikuno notices something and looks to Linzer, and he tells the Yadarat that even though that ship is very resistant, it won't withstand the energy emanating from that fissure, and if they get any closer, they will be destroyed. 
He needs Linzer to teleport them beyond the fissure. Cooler is surprised by this and asks if it's possible to teleport to another dimension. Barry Blue explains it, saying that the Yadarat race is known for having many tricks, and one of them is that instant transmission technique. But actually, teleporting to another dimension is quite a task even for this race, but Linzer is a prodigy in this technique even among his race. Cooler tells Frieza that he now understands why he brought Linzer. It's an insect with interesting tricks. Linzer does his technique, and then the ship instantly goes to Makai World. The demons of that realm, upon seeing the invading ship, will immediately destroy it. But Kikuno was prepared for that, so with the press of a button, he creates a force field that protects the ship from the creatures. Frieza says that, according to information given by Zuno, Janemba is in a floating fortress not far from that fissure. With this super fast ship, they should be there in a few hours, but they must be prepared. They will find resistance. A few hours later, they arrive at the castle, but the building is protected by a force field, but that won't be a problem. Linzer teleports them beyond the force field. When the ship lands, Frieza, Cooler, and Cooler's special forces leave. In the castle courtyard, they find a monster that is guarding the entrance, and as soon as it sees the invaders, the monster roars and runs towards them. Frieza says that this was a good opportunity for Cooler's men to show if they are still worthy of belonging to Frieza's great army. Cooler tells his men not to let him down. The trio of soldiers place themselves in front of their leaders. Captain Salza uses his tracker to measure the monster's power. The number is 250,000, which Salza finds impressive, but he says that together they will be able to win. The captain orders the soldiers to make battle formation 16, and they agree. Frieza, in his thoughts, reveals that he remembers this old division of Colt's army that surpassed the Ginyu special forces. While Dor is facing the monster, Frieza, in his thoughts, reveals that he, in brute strength, surpassed all soldiers in his father's army. He could compete in strength even with gigantic creatures. While Nice takes advantage that Dor stopped the monster and accumulates energy in one of his hands and releases this energy to paralyze the monster, Frieza thinks that he doesn't have such impressive attributes, but with this technique, he is able to paralyze even super strong creatures. With the monster paralyzed by Nyes, Salsa prepares a keyblade in his hand and then charges through the demon's back to kill him. And while the monster's head is separated from his body, Frieza reveals that Salsa's keyblade was capable of cutting through mountains like paper. While in active duty, he was considered the most powerful soldier in Cold's army, considerably surpassing Captain Ginyu. Well, in the end, Cooler's special forces, using an incredibly synchronized attack, easily defeated the Demon Guardian. Proud of his soldiers, Cooler sarcastically asks Frieza if he still doubts his soldiers' powers, and the Emperor admits they weren't bad. Meanwhile, they were watched by a trio of demons. They were surprised by the invaders had managed to defeat that demon so easily, which according to them was very powerful by the standards of that world. One of the demons asked if they should alert their master about these invaders. They could be the celestial mages, and their master ordered them to report anything strange that happened. But the white cloth demon calls his companion an idiot and says that they've been in that place for decades and that to prove their worth, they needed to face some enemies. Only then will their master recognize their their power, and then they wouldn't just be apprentices and become true guardians. And then he says that these invaders are definitely not the celestial mages, and that they will be squashed like cockroaches. Something explodes the door of that place. It was the invaders, Frieza, Cooler, and their soldiers. One of the demons says that no matter what they want, they won't go through. Frieza looks at Janemba's cocoon and says that it's good to know his next soldier is well guarded. But one of the demons says he can't make Janemba his soldier. This beast has colossal power and he can't be controlled. Frieza, with an annoyed expression, says that he has known someone with colossal power and that he has seen a method to control people like that. When he says that, he remembers Brawly. The guardian insists that he can't do that to Janemba, but Frieza doesn't want to talk and asks if Cooler's special forces can handle them. Salsa, measuring the enemy's power by the tracker, says they only have 20,000 power, which is ridiculous. Then he tells the other soldiers that no battle tactics are needed to deal with them, just attack. Cooler's special forces attack. Dor lands a punch on one of the demons. The other demon, drawing two swords, attacks Nyes, who retracts his head to avoid a deadly cut and then paralyzes the guardian with his energy. And Salsa, with his keyblade, attacks the guardian leader who defends himself with a sword that he takes out of his leg. But Salsa fires her key blast in his hand, making him drop his sword. And then Salsa attacks his enemy one more time to finish him off. But to the captain's surprise, the demon easily grabbed his blade with his hand. 
At the same moment, Thor, who thought he had seriously injured the other Guardian with his punch, has his arm caught and is counterattacked with the punch that knocks him down at the same moment, apparently affecting his organs. The other demon, who is apparently paralyzed by Nice's technique, shows that he can move and with an energy attack hits the soldier, who is surely defeated. Salza doesn't understand what's going on. With their fighting power, they shouldn't be able to do this. But then the tracker starts measuring another result, and now their power is 150 million. The demon leader says that he apparently misjudged the situation, and then he breaks the soldier's hand who falls to his knees. Cooler doesn't understand what's going on either, and asks Frieza if he gave his soldiers a broken tracker. Frieza explains that no, on the contrary, those trackers are the most advanced his army currently has. What happened was that the enemies were hiding their power, so the trackers could not detect it. Cooler, disapproving Frieza's attitude, asks why he didn't tell Salza and the others. Frieza replies he wanted to see how the soldiers dealt with the sudden change in enemy power. Meanwhile, while the demon leader makes Salsa suffer, he says that's what happens when they face the Celestial Guardians. But something hits the demon and pulls him away from Salsa. It was an attack launched by Cooler, who walks up to a subordinate's side. Cooler scolds Salsa, saying it's depressing to see his soldiers being humiliated like that and says he shouldn't have attacked without strategy. Salza apologizes. He didn't want his lord's intervention to be necessary. But Cooler, taking a good look at the enemy trio, concluded that no matter if his soldiers attacked with a good strategy or not, they wouldn't be able to defeat even one of the enemies. The difference in power was too great. That was a problem for him to solve himself. Cooler advances and facing the enemies says that they exposed his soldiers to ridicule and that group bears his name and no one shames his name and is unpunished. Now, they will be slaughtered by the Great Cooler.